information about quantitative research for legal studies with us today. Before we begin, let me introduce myself first. My name is Anissa. I am from Batch 2017 from Faculty of Law, Universitas Negeri Semarang, and I am glad to be your moderator for today. On behalf of Halo of Indonesia, I would like to remind you that this webinar session will also be streaming live on YouTube, and please mute your speakers before I let you speak during the Q&A session or in the time which the speakers allowed. This webinar will be divided in three sessions, which is the opening and then discussion and following with the Q&A session and the closing. I also would like to remind her that this is a safe place for everyone, so please be respectful towards one another. Next, joining with us today, the amazing, brilliant and wonderful women who has an interest broadly across the field of sociological of law. She has undertaken widespread empirical research, including interview, surveys, observation on many aspects of the legal system and legal profession. Her current work also focuses on the legal profession with special interest in women lawyer and gender and law. Other research topic that she actively working on is judiciary, legitimacy, judicial over, woman lawyer, judicial authorities, legal profession, and gender. Everyone, please welcome our speakers, Professor Sharon Rogue and Lou. Professor from Matthew Flinder, Distinguished Professor, College of Humanity, Art, and Social Science. Good afternoon, Professor. How are you today? Well, thank you, Anissa, and thank you for such um, a lovely and very warm welcome. I'm delighted to be able to talk about some of these issues to this group. Okay, thank you, Professor. I'm actually very nervous to actually being able to talk with a group professor like you. But Professor, before we begin the session, I would like to give the time for Dr. Awaluddin Marwan SHM Hub first to give a glimpse of these opening remarks. For Dr. Awaluddin Marwan SHMH, the time is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Anissa. Very good uh, opening and also good English. Uh, and a bit uh, shocking because I have a similar uh, university. Uh, I graduate from Smerang State University and um, we uh, had uh, a lot of experience uh, there because uh, our university is far away from a big city. Uh, it's difficult to speak English, actually. Uh, when I went to uh, Spain and learned from uh, Professor Sarin, uh, I was not able to speak fluently in English uh, until now because my accent is very strong, a uh, Japanese accent. <laughs> uh, so it's a bit uh, strange for um, international uh, forum when uh, I speak and uh, the, the accent is very uh, weird. Professor Sarin, thank you so much for your times. Uh, it's like a little reunion uh, mm. with you. Uh, first, I met you uh, in the class, uh, learning the quantitative research, and I always remember uh, about your lecture. Is, and I um, want to bring your course in Indonesia to uh, share your uh, uh, knowledge and experience because Indonesia really need uh, the, uh, to 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 be to be developed. Uh, the, 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 the science uh, and uh, my senior Asep already uh, did uh, the thesis under your supervision. Uh, mm. Unfortunately, it was passed away, and um, mm. but uh, his work uh, really influenced uh, our legal system and our legal cultures. Um, uh, we read uh, his thesis uh, and using some interview in his research and we can uh, uh, learn from you uh, how to use the quantitative survey for the uh, legal research. This is very important for us. Uh, again, thank you uh, for Professor Serins and thank you for the participants uh, attending 
attending this course. Uh, enjoy the discussions. Uh, this is very good moment uh, to learn from Professor Serens. And thank you for Anisa to lead uh, these discussions. Back to Anisa, please. Okay, uh, thank you. But before I continue uh, the discussion, I am very sorry if any of you hearing the Azan because here in Indonesia, we have like the Azan five times. So it's uh, the Azar time. Uh, maybe if you see, uh, if you hear throughout the speakers, uh, I can, um, I like to extend the time to uh, be quiet for a while until the Azan is over. So, okay. All right. Okay, thank you for Dr. Awuldin Marwan for the uh, uh, glimpse of the opening. Uh, it is a very wonderful opening for all of us. And I would like to say that, yes, this is a very great opportunity for all of us to actually learn for the from the professor herself. Although the Indonesia and Australia have like different cultures and different perspective toward the laws and the system, but it does not mean that we can have a new perspective and knowledge from the professor of Sarian Roach and Lu. Uh, so this is the moment that we've been waiting for. Uh, but before we get started to the core of the event, I would like to say that uh, you can also have a further information about Halo from the website halo.id or at halo.id on Instagram. And don't forget to download the app on the App Store and Google Play Store, Halo. Uh, all right, now is the time that we've been waiting for. We cannot wait any longer to gain new perspective and knowledge from the one and only Professor Sharon Roach and Lou. For, for Professor Sharon Roach and Lou, the time is yours. Okay. Um, thank you again, Anissa. And it was lovely to hear the sounds in the background. I really enjoyed that. Okay. Um, now, just in terms of timing, I think I will talk for maybe 40 minutes uh, and then there'll be some time for questions. So does that sound okay? Just maybe let me know with your thumbs up because I can only see... Uh, a few people on my screen and Anissa, of course, I can see you. So I'll be looking to you for, for guidance. Yeah, um, yeah, it's okay if you like to the time 45 minutes for the time of you and then question, question and answer will be following after that. Okay, okay. Uh, and uh, all right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start. And I have to say, uh, when our Laden um, asked me to prepare some um, comments and information about using quantitative research in um, legal studies or legal research, I have to say I struggled to think about where to begin uh, because there's a lot of really good information uh, and um, as our Ladin knows, in the context of his studies at the International Institute for the Sociology of Law, um, we can spend days on this material, not just an hour. So I have been necessarily uh, selective. Uh, and also, um, I'm, I have to say, your English is terrific, Awaladen. Um, and I'm not sure how um, receptive everyone will be to what I say. You know, unlike being in a... Um, in an actual classroom or a seminar room, I can see if people are thinking I'm talking too fast or too slow. So maybe, Anissa, if you could let me know if I'm going too fast or um, I need to repeat something because I can't tell uh, if, um, if everything, everybody's understanding and following everything I, I, I say because it may not be all that clear. Uh, and I do tend to talk fast. So, Anissa, I'm going to be relying on you and um, I'm, I'm ready to go. All right. So, uh, let me see. I have to find my... There we go. All right. So, um, as, as you mentioned, I'm a social scientist. So, my background is in sociology. 
Um, but I've also done a law degree and all my research has been looking at the intersection between law and society. And I am committed to what's known as empirical research methods. Uh, and I'm just going to try and get rid of something off my screen. Ah, um, empirical research methods. Um, and so I've got a few, a, a, some preliminary comments around social research. So social research is really a way of um, describing reality or somehow kind of constructing, constructing or recreating a reality. Social research generates information, information and knowledge that might help us in our everyday work but also um, assist policy making um, and policy formulation. Unlike anecdotes or people's experiences or observations, research is systematic. It's generalizable. You wanna be able to say some general uh, things. You wanna be able to draw some general conclusions and it um, follows an accepted methodology. Social scientists often make a distinction between quantitative and qualitative research. And I should say at this point, I don't draw a really hard distinction between quantitative and qualitative research, but that's for another day. I'm, I'm not going to talk about that, but I'm going to um, talk about more quantitative research today. Okay, now, before we start, I, I guess um, doing research and across my career, um, there have been various challenges to doing um, and undertaking um, social science research in legal settings. Um, one thing is social researchers are outsiders. So if you're doing research on courts or judges, which I have, uh, or on the legal profession, or any, any aspect of legal institutions or legal processes, social researchers aren't part of those environments, aren't part of those settings. And as social scientists, we have um, our own concepts, frameworks, theories, which are necessarily and inevitably unfamiliar um, to people in the legal settings, to lawyers, to judges, to court officials. On the other side, um, often um, people inside courts or legal systems um, want some research, want some information, want to understand something about those who take their um, concerns to court. They want to know something about lawyers who work in particular courts. They want to know something about the um, mental health or well-being of judges who work in courts. Yet they may not have the skills and they probably don't have the skills and the capacity to undertake the research. So there, there needs to be quite a lot of conversation and dialogue between those in the legal setting um, and the researchers who are trying to generate information and knowledge about what's going on in the context of the legal setting, whatever that might be. Okay, so um, research in socio-legal settings is pretty vast. There's a lot of it. Um, and there's a lot of aspects of the legal setting that are subject to empirical research and quantitative research. Um, researchers have been looking at how law operates in practice, so the law in action. You might have a law which prohibits um, certain activities. Well, let's see how that works in action. You have a law that prohibits discrimination, for example. Okay, well, how does that um, operate in the context of workplaces or organisations? Is it effective? Um, do people take their concerns or make complaints around discrimination if they experience it? What impact is the law having in ordinary everyday workplaces? 
Also, there's a lot of research looking at legal professions, um, you know, how the legal profession works, the size of the legal profession, the gender diversity, the ethnic diversity, um, also other kinds of research that relies on quantitative methods, uh, various people's perceptions of law and legal processes. So maybe litigants' perception of going to court or criminal defendants' perceptions of going to court or um, disputants' perceptions of the mediation processes that might be available in a court system. Another example is the operation of legal organisations or institutions. How do courts work? What are some of the aspects of different kinds of courts that you can um, think about and measure quantitatively? And a, a, another example, I mean, the list is long. These were just ones that came into my head uh, fairly quickly. And another one would be to look at the work and role of activists and their impact on legal change, uh, legal change in terms of um, legislation or and the work of um, governments and parliaments or legal change in terms of its impact on the decisions um, that judges might make in courts. So the area is vast, and I guess what I'm saying that there are many areas thinking about um, legal settings or legal institutions which are amenable to um, quantitative research. Uh, and when we start doing research and all researchers um, work with concepts. So we tend to work with fairly complex concepts and this is no truer um, than in the legal setting or the socio-legal setting. So again, just some of the complex um, and multidimensional concepts um, that I've worked with over the past few years are things like the rule of law, impartiality, legal consciousness, dispute resolution, legitimacy. You think, okay, well, I'd like to do a survey and ask people what they think about legal consciousness or impartiality. But if you do that, um, your respondents might not have any idea of what you mean by such concepts. What do you mean by rule of law? What do you mean by impartiality? legal consciousness, and so on. So these complex concepts have to be defined and then we have to have ways of asking questions that can give us information about impartiality or legal consciousness and so on. Okay, so that's, I just got ahead of myself for a moment. So we start with these um, complex concepts and we might have a broad general definition of what that might mean. Um, we have a definition of what impartiality is. Our definition might be not being biased, treating um, all sides of the dispute equally and not favoring anybody in the court. Um, but these are very complex concepts and I'm, I'm going to run through an actual example in, in a little while. Um, so we have to have lots of different kinds of questions that might get at these complex um, concepts. And we have to be have a way of getting the information of measuring impartiality or observing impartiality. So we have to have ways or indicators that can give us some information about these com co very complex concepts that we work with in socio-legal settings, in settings, um, law practices, law offices, courts, um, we can broaden that even further to think about uh, people who work in corrections, 
uh, people who work in the police. I mean, I guess many of my examples are going to come primarily from the research that I've undertaken on the legal profession and courts, but I don't mean to be that limited uh, because, of course, there's lots of other research and other things that you might be interested in. Okay, so when we're um, measuring um, these con complex concepts, we um, talk about very, we use as social scientists particular language. And um, we use the language of variables, things that vary. So to go back to my earlier list of complex concepts that can be used in the context of law, let's stay with impartiality and say, well, impartiality is something that varies. You might say, well, we're going to look at the level of impartiality among judges in the different courts in the Indonesian justice system. So you think, well, impartiality is something that might vary. You would hope um, in a legal system that relies on the rule of law, that impartiality would not vary very much. But you might say, well, in some uh, courts, there's more impartiality than in others. Um, you might say, uh, okay, a different kind of concept would be, let's say, legal representation. So whether or not um, litigants or defendants in court have a lawyer to defend their um, to, to defend their claims, and you might say, well, some people have more or better legal representation than others. So legal representation is a variable. It's something that varies. Um, whereas an attribute is a characteristic of, of a thing. So you could might, might say, well, this judge is very fair. So this is a characteristic of this judge. So when we think about doing quantitative research, because quantitative research is really related to a model of science. The idea that we are discovering things, um, that we're using scientific method to generate facts and information. So in that context, we try sometimes to figure out what is related to what. So what might cause, for example, High levels of Hi, legal representation. Oh, hello. Yep. Oh, sorry, I, I thought, um, Anissa, do I have a question or a comment? No, I think like somebody turned on the mic, but it's. Oh, okay. Enough. All right. Okay. So while we've just taken a quick pause, how's it going for everyone? Um, about the right pace, too slow, too fast? It's good, Rolf. Okay, I'll, I'll go with that. Thank you. All right, so just backing up a little bit in terms of the um, notion of science, that we like to see if certain things are related to other things, whether the um, kind of court is related to legal representation, for example. So you might say, well, the higher the court, the more likely... Um, participants will have lawyers representing their interests. But in the lower courts, um, there's not much legal representation. That would be the case in Australia. So you might say, well, level of court is an independent variable and it seems to affect whether or not people have legal representation. So when we look at the Supreme Courts, nearly everyone in Supreme Court will have legal representation. If we look at the lowest courts in Australia, um, relatively few people have legal representation. So it looks like there's an impact or an effect of an independent variable on a dependent variable. That is just a very simple and perhaps simplistic example, but I'm, I'm going to um, flesh out um, some more examples in a moment. So it's important to be able to measure 
our complex concepts and to be able to get information on various dimensions of those concepts. Okay. All right, so here's some examples. So I'm thinking of the Indonesian court system as a variable. Okay, it's something that varies. Uh, and forgive me if I've made an error, but I had to quickly do some research and I discovered that there are three main courts, the Supreme Court, High Courts and the District Court, as well as a large number of special courts. So if I wanted to do a fairly um, simple measurement of the Indonesian court system, I would divide it into four. Um, and I would go around at many courts and identify whether they're a Supreme Court, a High Court, a District Court, or a Special Court. And let's say I'm interested in um, the number of judges, which courts have more judges. So I would not only take information about the court system, I would also take information about the number of judges. I also might be interested um, in the age of the judges or the gender of the judges. So these are all variables. They're all things that vary and that we can measure. So I might find that the Supreme Court has 50 judges and the district courts have 5,000, for example. So I'm measuring the number of judges in the different court systems. There's lots of other things I could measure. I could measure age. Um, and you have some decisions uh, when you're going to quantify material or quantify information. Um, you can measure age in a number of ways. You could ask, how old are you? So you'd get a number. Or you could ask the year of birth or the date of birth, the year and the date of birth. So even though we might think age is a relatively um, simple um, variable, there's actually lots of ways of getting information or lots of different kinds of questions that you can get information in terms of um, age. Okay, so let's say in our um, piece of research, we, we want to know how satisfied judges are with their work. And we have some uh, hypotheses that the higher the court, the more satisfied the judge will be. So we're going to do a survey um, on judge, ask judges how satisfied they are. And again, this is a really complex concept. So we could ask how satisfied are you with your job? And they might tick very satisfied, satisfied, neither, dissatisfied and very dissatisfied. So we would just get a little bit of information about job satisfaction. You could ask a whole lot of other questions about job satisfaction. So you would get at different dimensions or different aspects of job satisfaction. How satisfied are you with your job? Would you recommend being a judge to a friend? Would you become a judge again if you had the opportunity? And how does your current job compare to the sort of job you wanted when you took it? And how satisfied are you with the way that your job allows you to um, mix your work and your personal life? So you can see you're getting at a lot more dimensions of job satisfaction. And even more, you can ask, instead of saying, how satisfied are you with your job? You can ask about different aspects of the job. How satisfied are you? So you could do this, and, and, and I have done this in our research, ask judges how satisfied they are with the salary or with their hours or with their geographical location. You can also ask, how satisfied are they with some of the intrinsic or some of the aspects of being a judge that is 
part of being the judge. So the nature of the work, the diversity of the work, the intellect, intellectual challenge. So you can see very quickly, I started with one question, how, how satisfied with your job are you? And depending on what I want to know in my research or what you want to know in your research, this can quickly um, snowball into a lot of different questions. But when you ask some of these finer grained questions, you're getting a lot richer and more detailed information about job satisfaction. Okay, so you've got your research question, you've got your topic, you've got your um, concepts, you've got your measures, you've got your questions. And so in this example, I'm thinking, well, I'm, I'm interested in looking at job satisfaction across the court structure in Indonesia. I've already talked a little bit about where to collect the data. So I'm going to send a survey to judges um, in Indonesia. But one thing I don't know is how many judges are there in Indonesia? Three, Can anybody oh, answer? 3,000, still 5,000 maybe. Four. So 5,000? Yes. Okay. It. All right. So you might think, okay, um, this is 5,000 is a lot of judges. Maybe I'm going to just do a, a sample. I'm not going to survey all of them. I'll just do a sample. So you've got to make some decisions about where to collect the data um, and from whom to collect the data. Who are you going to ask about this information? And um, what kinds of information will they provide? Um, are they going to provide information about their workplace or are they going to provide information about their own attitudes or their own experiences? So again, wording of the question um, is something that takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. Okay, so as I've, I've flagged earlier, um, and this is um, perhaps people might say, some researchers might say that the survey is really the kind of gold standard of social science research. I think um, that once might have been the case, uh, but in terms of doing quantitative research, um, surveys have been and are widely used. They're one kind of um, data collection, um, one of, and they have, and this is something about all kinds of research. There are benefits and there are limits. So um, it's important to kind of think about, again, going back to the research question and what you want to know. Um, another big factor is what kind of resources you have to do the research. Um, but you have to make decisions and be aware that there's no perfect kind of um, data collection. It is um, benefits and limits and you have to weigh them up. Um, and one of the um, aims of a survey, if you, if you do a sample, let's say you think, well, sending out um, 5,000 surveys to um, all the judges in Indonesia um, is, is a very big job. I'll just do 500. So I'll, do, uh, I'll, I'll take a sample of that 5,000 or 50,000 or 20,000, and I will just send my survey to that sample. But I want to be able to draw some inferences from that sample, from my findings, to be able to make some generalizations to the whole Indonesian judiciary, for example, or the whole Indonesian legal profession. If you're interested in studying lawyers in Indonesia, um, you might have a smaller subset of that population and then um, send the survey to that subset. But you want to be able to make some generalizations from the sample to the population. And as I mentioned, um, there's advantages and disadvantages. One advantage of a survey is that you can send it out to many people. 
uh, and so it's quite cost efficient. The other uh, one disadvantage is that response rates don't tend to be very high. Um, and so there's lots of articles and discussion about how to improve or increase the response rates. Um, and also, you, you get quite limited on the kinds of questions and the number of questions that can be asked in a survey. Now, I guess as you're all realising, each one of these slides, I could spend 15 minutes at least on. So I'm really just able to give you a little bit of a taste. Okay, so social surveys can be administered in various ways. They can be face-to-face -face with an interviewer and the respondent who tells the interviewer what to write down. They can be mailed through the post. Um, and this is probably not going to happen very much anymore because um, there are so many web-based surveys um, that are administered through the internet or through email. Um, another one is telephone surveys, which are sometimes used. Um, all these forms of administration have different disadvantages and advantages, and they all have different implications for the time they take, the kind of staff or collaborators that you need, and importantly, although it's not on the slide, the resources that doing the survey. It's not just doing the survey, it's also analysis of the survey results um, and findings that takes a lot of time. Okay, so, and I've mentioned some of these already. So some of the things that um, when you're doing quantitative research, when you're administering the survey is to think about the sample, to think about the response rates, how can you increase response rates, um, designing the questionnaire, designing the questions so that they are clear and not ambiguous, they're easy to understand, um, and to think about what kinds of responses you'll get, whether you have open-ended questions for people to type in or write in their responses, or whether they're tick a box or press a button on the web-based survey. So there's a lot of things to think about when um, you're thinking about doing a piece of research. Um, response rates, just a, a, a couple of um, comments. Um, response rates can really be affected by the quality or the credibility of the survey and the researchers. Um, response rates are affected by the topic, by the nature of the sample, by how difficult it is to complete the um, survey, how long it is. If you have a very long survey, then people are not likely to complete it because they get um, fatigued or they get bored um, or they're not, they find it less interesting than other things that they may be during, doing with their time. There's also concerns, and this is certainly a really big um, concern that we experienced with our um, research on judges, is issues of confidentiality, of maintaining anonymity, confidentiality. So any responses cannot be traced to particular individuals. Okay, so I mentioned um, the sample, I, I, I don't think I need to say any more about this, um, except just to reinforce the comment I made earlier about the um, importance of wanting to be able to make some general statements um, from the sample um, to the broader population. So let's say you're interested in um, lawyers and some of lawyers we'll go with job satisfaction, job satisfaction among lawyers in Indonesia. So you somehow get a list of all the lawyers in Indonesia, if that were possible. Um, it would be very difficult, I imagine. But let's say you can get a list of all the lawyers in Indonesia. I think, okay, well, this is 20,000 lawyers. I'll get a sample of 1,000 
So I'll take a sample of 1,000 lawyers. I'll send out my survey to these lawyers and I'll ask them lots of questions about job satisfaction. But from, from my um, sample, only 500 get back to me. So while you've started with 10 or 20,000 in the population, you might only end up with a very small um, segment of uh, respondents to the survey. So these are all things that people have to think about and manage and deal with, because sometimes there's really nothing you can do about it except be aware and also be really transparent in how you report, how you undertook the study, how you constructed the sample, how you wrote the questions or why you wrote certain kinds of questions. So I think being really transparent in describing the research design is absolutely essential. Okay, um, I am going to skip this slide in, uh, in the interest of time because I think I've said enough about sampling. Um, and I just want to come back to um, making a, a couple of comments about uh, difficult populations. Now, um, I, I take this term from something I read very early um, during our research on judges and an article that talked about judges as difficult populations for social researchers. Okay, so what does that mean? Um, the difficult populations can be difficult to reach or locate, hard to find. I, mean, I mentioned a moment ago um, the possibility of finding a list of all the lawyers in Indonesia. Now, that's going to be very difficult. Um, and so it's going to be, I'd say, impossible to locate all the lawyers practicing currently today in Indonesia. Um, in Australia, with a, a lower population than Indonesia and a smaller legal profession, that is still going to be very difficult to locate every lawyer in Australia. Also, um, when you're studying professionals, lawyers, um, courts, judges, these are very busy people. And so they don't have a lot of time to be completing a survey or to be participating in social research. And often they are unfamiliar with surveys. So um, certainly when we started our research on judges, judges would say, well, why do I need to fill out this survey? How is this going to help me? When I go into court tomorrow, what benefit would this survey have to me and my work? Um, and so it's really important that um, participants in the survey can see some value to either them personally or to their profession or to their workplace or to the legal institution, for example. Okay, um, when you're designing the questionnaire, which is part of the survey, I mentioned it's really important to think about the length of the um, survey because people get fatigued, uh, they get bored, um, they get frustrated, and then they decide they're not going to complete the survey. And that, from the point of view of the researcher, that's, that's not good. Different kinds of questions. You can ask the ticker box questions, or you can ask people to write in something. Uh, and also in terms of the actual survey document, it's important to think about which questions go where. But these are all kind of down the track, checklist kinds of issues that when you're thinking about quantitative research, thinking about surveys, are things that you need to make decisions about. Okay, um, again, um, you've got to keep in mind your respondents, the participants, the survey, the people who are going to respond to your survey. Um, and their responses are going to be affected by all kinds of things. Um, they're going to be affected by their memory, whether they can recall something that occurred some years ago. Um, they may not be accurate. If you ask people, 
how many people work in your court, they may not know. Um, or they may say, oh, 20, but that may not be accurate. Um, also, do people who are responding to your uh, survey, do they have the knowledge and the information that you're asking? And as I said a moment ago, do they have the time to complete the survey? Okay, well, increasingly, um, Anissa, um, how much time do I have before we get to the Q&A? Okay, it's still 15 minutes. Okay, so I've um, got just a couple more slides. So um, we'll have some more time for Q&A. Um, instead of doing um, surveys, increasingly um, what's known as secondary data sets is becoming available for researchers to use. And what I mean by secondary data sets or secondary data is information or statistics or surveys that have been collected by other people or they have been collected for one person for purpose um, but you but that can be used for another for example um, let's take the police so if we say the police in Australia they collect a lot of information about the cases they process, about the kinds of cases they process. And these can be used by researchers. So the data is created by the police about the number and kinds of cases they process. But researchers, if they can get access to those um, data that the police collect, can use them for their research purposes. Or there's lots of survey data that survey researchers have undertaken and you can access this survey data and use it for your own analyses, so for your own quantitative analyses. This is much easier and less expensive than doing your own survey, but there are limits and limitations. Um, one of them is that you're stuck with the quality of the data that's been created by another researcher or another organisation. If you're using the data that's been generated in somebody else's survey, you're stuck with their questions. So maybe they haven't asked the kinds of question that you were interested in in relating to job satisfaction. They've just asked, how satisfied are you with your job? And you think, I would have liked to have asked all these other questions. But you think, okay, there's a couple of questions there. I can do some interesting analysis um, and it's available now. And I don't have to go through that long and difficult and expensive process of running my own survey. So sometimes um, having data that's produced by other researchers or other organisations is a really good way of getting some quantitative material without the huge effort um, that you as researcher would need to undertake. And governments of various kinds and government departments, as well as international organisations, um, international organisations like the United Nations, um, like um, the World Health Organisation, um, like the World Bank, um, collect all kinds of data on all kinds of things, which may be available and accessible to do some quantitative analyses around um, legal institutions or around legal settings. And these are just some of um, the statistics and some of the data that is available in Australia and would be available in parallel in many other countries. So the census, for example, is a source of um, an incredible amount of data that can be um, uh, analyzed quantitatively. 
crime statistics. I, rem I mentioned a moment ago um, that police collect data on the kinds of crimes that they process, the kinds of defendants, um, the age of the defendant, the postcode of the defendant, the gender of the defendant, the kinds of offences, whether or not um, the defendant has a criminal record. All of these things are collected um, in the context of um, the criminal justice system. And so they're there and much easier to access than um, doing a survey. Prison statistics, um, for example, in Australia on the 30th of June every year, the number of prisoners across the whole country is counted. And so we have what's known as longitudinal data. We can see whether the numbers and kinds of prisoners is changing over time. So if you're interested in whether or not, um, for example, which would be something that um, people in Australia might be interested in, whether there's increasing imprisonment of women. So you could take um, data from 20 years ago and see if the proportion of women in Australian prisons is going up or down. Um, so you could get that information without individually having to contact prisons and ask about the number of uh, men and women in, in the jail at the time. Um, in terms of civil courts, uh, there's data uh, in Australia on the number of civil filings and the kinds of filings and uh, disputes that exist in um, civil law, uh, finance data, income data, health statistics. We all see a lot of health statistics these days because um, especially around COVID-19, there's a lot of reporting around the statistics and there's a lot of different statistics um, related to COVID that gets reported. Suicide rates, other government um, or non-government organisation surveys. Uh, for example, in Australia, um, every now and then the uh, federal government undertakes a national household drug strategy survey, which asks people about um, alcohol, tobacco and illicit drug consumption. So that's a survey that the government funds and undertakes, which can be used by researchers um, and is, is quite a, um, a, a, a rich um, and important source of information if people are interested in um, drug use in the country. Okay, so now you're inspired to read a little bit more about um, some of these issues. Um, and so this is uh, just a very brief list of some um, resources which could be useful in um, thinking about um, doing this kind of research. And uh, finally, just a snapshot of some of the research uh, that I've been involved in some of the publications that I've been involved in the past um, few years. Uh, most of them relate to judges and courts. And um, some of the research that I've been involved in has entailed surveys um, of the judiciary. And if anybody is interested in, and I've just thought about this, um, there is a there is an attempt. Somebody is trying to do an international survey that looks at the use of technology by judges and courts, and they're hoping to run the survey in different countries. And so, I am not sure if there's somebody from Indonesia who's um, involved in that survey, but I can certainly find out and pass on that information to Anissa or Awaladan, even if you're not um, interested in the actual survey, you might be interested later on in some of the results and some of the comparative results around the use of technology um, by courts. Okay, and that brings me to the um, end of my 
uh, slides. And as I've updated these slides, uh, I can send them to Anissa or um, Awaladin um, later on, well, after the, um, after the lecture, if you like. So that brings me to the end of the um, prepared uh, talk that I, that I have. So over to you, um, Anissa. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Serins. What a wonderful insight about the quantitative research for algal studies from Professor Serins, Roach, and Lou. It totally gave an eye opening and new knowledge for all of us, especially for law students. Uh, and especially for me, myself, who have never used this kind of methods uh, in doing the research, it gave me a lot of insight that to actually do the survey, we literally, we literally need to prepare. So at the end of the day, we satisfied with the result. I can say as a final uh, low, use, low year students, um, the majority of the law student in Indonesia uh, we are obligated to make a final research uh, as a term to finally pass the studies. And a lot of us are having trouble on how to actually get the data for our works. And one of the main thing is because we first, we don't usually getting taught to do a proper research do, uh, by using the quantitative research. And second, we get confused by the process because we don't study about the methods deeper and properly. Many of the people around me are afraid to actually use the quantitative research because first it takes a lot of time. And the stigma here is the faster you get up from the university means that you are clever enough. And that's what makes them think to take the short way to actually do the normative methods uh, rather than using the quantitative methods. Mm -hmm. So uh, the question is uh, if they end up and the case is uh, they actually end up to do actually uh, the if they should use the quantitative research they more likely to do the google form to actually get the data so it's like a, a short way to 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 get them to act to what they need the data to collect the data faster um, my question is how can we make sure that the quality of the data it actually work or appropriate as the research data. Uh, that's the first one. And then for everyone who would like to ask the question, you can use the feature raise hand and I will allow you to uh, take turn um, or you, actually, uh, you can uh, write down your name and I will call you and you can turn off your uh, microphone if you like to. Okay, so I've just stopped sharing my screen so that I can see more of you. Um, and that would be great, Anissa, if you could field the questions because um, I, I, someone may have their hand up and I may not be able to see it because I can't see everybody on my screen. Okay, so you've asked about the quality of the data. Um, I mean, that's a really, that is a fundamental question and kind of difficult to answer. I mean, in the context of your projects that you... It's four o'clock. Oh, sorry? Okay. Sorry, it's from my MacBook. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, you know, I think one of the really important things is to think about the research question that you have and to think about what's the best way of getting some data to answer that research question. And in fact, the best way may be to see what kind of secondary data is available that you might be able to use in some quantitative way. Now, I have not talked about using statistical packages or using um, the computer to generate tables. That is such a specific um, set of skills that, that actually takes a lot of learning. So you're absolutely right. There, I think there's no way of cutting corners. And I would say the quicker you're out, perhaps the more corners you've cut. And so that the quality of the research is not there in a way that if you'd been more methodical and more reflective and taken more time, you might have produced a better quality piece of research. Um, certainly, a lot of people use things like SurveyMonkey or Qualtrics to do quick surveys. Um, I mean, that is all okay, but I think the, the crucial thing 
is to be very clear on what you've done and why you've done it that way. Uh, and to not make the data work too hard. Let's say you, you know, I go back to my example of the um, survey of lawyers. Let's say you get 10 respondents and you think, well, you know, this is not very successful. You're not going to be able to say anything about the legal profession in Indonesia. So don't try to, but try to say what you can from the limited data that you have. And as these are part of your studies and student projects, you don't have the time or the resources to do a highly sophisticated, long and detailed survey. So my advice would be to see what's already there, to see what data is already available that you might be able to use rather than having to do your own um, survey from scratch almost. Okay, thank you, Professor. So it's actually an advice for every one of us. Uh, if we do the research, make sure that we we care about the quality rather than just to done it quickly. Yeah. Because I don't know in Australia, but here in Indonesia, we have like this, uh, the faster you get from university means that you are clever enough. And that's, I think that's the wrong perspective to have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I see it, uh, someone raising hand because it like to ask a question. Uh, I will let you, Ibu Sri Purnama or Mbak Sri Purnama, to ask your question. You may be able to turn off your speak. Or if you're okay. So, can you hear my voice? Yep, clearly. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Professor Anlu, for the amazing presentation. So. As a context before I address my question, so I'm really interested in social legal, and I did not expect that um, this presentation would more address the quantitative, uh, like pra practical. So basic question for you, um, I still cannot have a grasp on how to like differentiate between social legal and just empirical research. So. I know that social legal, it's always empirical, but it's not vice versa. So I don't know how to determine it. And the second question would be, you know, in Indonesia, there's also a perspective that law students, the one, the people that go to law school, they just don't, they hate it, maths. So they really hate statistics and all that. And the way you told us, like how statistic matter that this is actually like scientific um, reasoning and all that, like, how do you actually incorporate the statistics and quantitative research to your, uh, res uh, to your paper? And like, how far the statistic um, knowledge that you really need to fulfill this kind of research? Because I read the book by Michael Finkelstein about statistics for lawyers, and it's really difficult to understand because I don't have background on it. Thank you. Okay, again, some uh, really important and big questions. Thank you, Sri. Okay, so I think sociolegal um, is, is really interested in the intersection between law and society. So it's about um, the kinds of concepts or the kinds of settings. I mean, you could be sociolegal theory um, so I don't see a socio-legal as necessarily being empirical. But empirical research I take to be where you are getting some information um, directly from participants in your research project. So you're asking people in an interview, you're observing them, um, you're sending out a survey. So you're trying to... To, you actually create the data yourself. So in a way, the survey is creating the data because the responses to the questions don't exist until the questions have been asked. So when you generate your data set, you've actually in a way created that. But you're, what you're trying to do, I guess, is capture reality, whatever that means. So you want to capture, say, say you're interested in the ways in which lawyers give advice to their um, 
to their um, clients uh, and you, you're interested in how much information about law lawyers give when they're talking with their clients. And so you might um, be involved in that research as an observer. So you sit in the office and you make notes about what the lawyer is talking to the client about. So you're hoping that your notes reflect a reality. But in a sense, you're summarizing that reality from your own perspective. So I see empirical as, as creating information and data um, that's, that's kind of contemporary. We could say, well, actually is using census data or using um, a, a survey that somebody else has collected is that empirical data? Well, yes, it is, because it's been collected from a large number of individuals. Look, the, the question about um, statistics, I mean, I, I think it's probably pretty silly to expect um, law students to be um, sophisticated users of social science research techniques when they're at law school, unless they have particular training and courses and programs to teach those skills um, because you can't just um, you know they don't, they're not in the air you can't just breathe them in and they become part of your skill set um, so I think for an undergraduate lawyer or for you know a law student um, expecting sophisticated use of statistics is just really um, quite silly and naive because these are very complex bodies of knowledge with, um, so there's not only the, the technical dimension, but there's also the epistemological. You've got to really understand what you're doing when you are generating statistics. And I think if you, if you turn that around and said, you know, the, the student who's done a lot of quantitative analysis and does survey research and um, does reports using lots of numbers, they have to write a law, the, a law research project at the end of their degree. Well, I think the legal profession would get very angry and upset and say, well, how can somebody who has no training in law now write a paper on law? Well, they can't. So I think if you turn it around, it, it, it's, it's quite um, naive, although I can understand why it happened, to think that people have naturally those skills unless there's some specific training which is more than a one hour lecture given by Zoom, has to be a lot more than that. I hope that kind of goes some way to answering the question. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor. Okay, thank you. So everyone else would like to ask a question. Uh, you can may press the raise hand button. Okay, so professor, there is someone who actually messaged me privately because like their Zoom is, uh, I think they got trouble, but mm -hmm. I got the message. Um, he asked that, is that possible to collect data from the WhatsApp group or email for the matter of quantitative research? And then the second question is, how big the impact of the data and artificial intelligence influence quantitative research method? Okay. Uh, well, one thing that I didn't mention um, at all, and it is a big issue, and um, I'm, I can just really only comment briefly on it, is the question of consent. So the issue about using WhatsApp um, I'm, I don't really know what that means, whether you would contact people via WhatsApp, ask them questions and they would send it back, um, or whether you're collecting information about a WhatsApp group that already exists. So um, just depends. But um, normally when um, 
surveys are administered, the fact that somebody um, completes the survey and returns it is an indication that they consent to participate. So free and voluntary consent, of course, is essential in doing any kind of empirical research. I can't um, emphasize that enough. Now, the question of artificial intelligence, um, yeah, I, I guess um, that taps into the idea that there are, there's lots of data that's collected um, kind of automatically by organizations and whether some of that can be available for research. I mean, we all know that um, social media um, and Facebook, there's been a lot of um, discussion about that, the way in which they scrape personal information um, from individuals without their um, kind of full awareness and consent. I mean, they may have consented to us to it in the kind of small print at the end of a document that's 100 pages long, um, but that people being unaware of what's happening to their private data or information about them, and then that's used um, for marketing purposes. So certainly a lot of data about us as individuals is collected automatically by organisations, um, which can be used for research. Many of those organizations are private organizations, um, and so they may not be av as available as things, well, certainly in Australia, so I can't talk about um, other countries, but um, things that the Australian Bureau of Statistics, for example, produces is widely available to researchers. Um, things, information that um, social media uh, creates, or generates is not is not necessarily going to be accessible to researchers. So the question of, of AI is is a really big one, um, and one that I haven't really um, looked at in the context of research very carefully. Um, and you probably will be aware that there's um, lots of arguments around the use of AI in courts um, and whether. Uh, certain decisions can be produced through AI and that you no longer need a judge to make decisions in particular kinds of court cases. Certainly in Australia, that is very uh, controversial. Uh, and as you can imagine, judges do not like that idea at all. But it is something that's being discussed. If you have enough information, let's say, on a, in a criminal case, whether um, if you put all that information into a program, whether that can generate the penalty and you no longer need the judge to adjudicate the penalty. Um, so yes, yeah, so AI is something that's cropping up in a lot of areas, not just social research, but also in law. And you're probably more aware of some of those um, uh, discussions than, than I am. Okay, thank you, Professor. So uh, last question maybe from anyone here would like to extend a question to Professor Serin. There is still time before we get to the closing. If you'd like to ask, then you may uh, use the feed to raise hand and I will let you to unmute your speaker. Is there anyone? Okay, so I see one. This is maybe our last question from uh, Mufti Holis. Okay, thank you, Professor. And thank you, the moderator, for the times. I will uh, give the question, uh, the, maybe it's the comparative law. Uh, I think the quantitative risk method, especially in the legal research, is not familiar in my country. But I think it's important thing also for the judge because judge made the law. Uh, can you give me uh, some compar comparison or the, the example how the Australian law system make the quantitative research method to make it, the law system be better? Thank you. Yeah, again, um, a really important question. Thank you. 
Uh, that is a really big issue in Australia in general discussions about research, and that is the impact um, of research on policy. So you've asked around courts and judges, and um, I, I guess it all depends. I mean, there have been some really important pieces of research recently that have looked at um, some mental health issues and well-being among judges um, who are experiencing, especially in the lower courts, who are experiencing um, very high caseloads, um, quite distressing cases that involve um, violence and difficult um, situations. A number of judges are feeling stressed and burned out. And, and the extent of this issue was made visible by doing some surveys. Because you might talk to a judge and a judge says, oh, I have too much work. And you think, oh, well, that just a judge has too much work. But when a lot of judges are saying that, then there's an issue. And so a survey allows you to get information from a lot of judges. And that, that has been the case. And so that information has been relayed to various organisations who have the role to make changes. Now, some of the changes may not be all that significant. Um, for example, um, education programs, um, the availability of counselling, um, uh, programs around managing work, uh, claims to government to increase the number of judges sitting on courts. So there can be different ways in which a, a piece of research might impact on a policy process and have an effect in the working lives of, of judges. But it's not a clear cut or direct link. Uh, it takes a lot of work, but certainly while a number of judges have been saying their caseloads have um, been increasing, when it's one or two people saying that, then government doesn't really take much notice. But when it's a report that shows the extent of the problems, then they are more likely to take notice. But, I mean, we're all aware of the policy process uh, that, um, you know, at the end of the day, it depends on the policy makers and um, the political will as to whether um, things change. Uh, but, but certainly in the context of the courts in Australia, there have been some changes that have come from empirical research demonstrating the nature of some of the issues confronting the judiciary. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, Professor, once again. Okay, as much as I like to extend the time to this insightful conversation, sadly, we have come to an end of the session, which is the closing one. It has been a, a well-spent afternoon and amazing lectures given by Professor Serin Roach Alu. Um, thank you very much for the time, Professor, and the knowledge. Uh, if you don't mind to send the presentation to Mr. Awaludin or the HALO um, so that we can share for the participants right here. So on behalf on HALO, of HALO Indonesia, I would like to express my apologies if there is a mistake during my duty as a moderator. And I hope you guys satisfied with the today's webinar. And don't forget to check up on HALO Indonesia website and Instagram for more information about webinar. And also don't forget to fill the link on the chat room given by Mbak Siti Farida or Ate from HALO Indonesia. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Professor. And thank you, Mr. Awaludin. Thank you for all the participants. It has been an insightful and wonderful afternoon. See you in another webinar session. My name is Anissa. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anissa. You've done an incredible job. Thank you very much for being so generous. And um, your comments um, are very gratifying. So I appreciate them. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. Okay, bye bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Bye, Professor. Bye. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Nama Fajri Krama Terbuan. See you. Bye-bye. I'm going to sign out now. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. 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 B